And at the moment, we've got somebody who thinks they might edge it in this contest by making people scared. It's a very similar tactic to the one that Donald Trump has been using in the US for eight years. He's not alone. He's made it electorally successful. And Jenrick, you can't help thinking, is hoping the same thing will rub off on him here. As the dad of three daughters, the Southport attack hit me personally. Of course, the legal process needs to be respected, but I'm seriously concerned that the facts may have been withheld from the public here. The government and authorities told us for months that they were not treating this as a terrorist incident. But today, the attacker has been charged with terrorist offences, and it has been revealed that he has been allegedly reading terrorist manuals. This atrocity was of immense public concern. The public had the right to know the truth right away. That Any was Robert Jenrick, one of the two candidates for the Tory leadership. And the votes have just closed on that contest. He could be, by Saturday night, the next leader. So why has he taken to social media to start spouting conspiracy theories? But since when does the public have a right to know immediately about legal process? The wheels of justice turn slowly. What is Robert Jenrick going to do to the Conservative Party if he wins? Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And let's go back to earlier in the week when the police laid additional charges against the man who's been accused and charged of murdering the three young kids who were at a Taylor Swift dance class in Southport in the summer holidays. Um, and the additional charges are that he was in possession of material that was of a terrorist nature and possibly in possession, allegedly, of uh, ricin. And this has sparked, in turn, well, why weren't we told immediately from Robert Jenrick. Yeah, and it is worth remembering that Robert Jenrick is actually a lawyer. I mean, we think he has been legally trained. He's worked as a lawyer. He's meant to understand due process. He's meant to understand the integrity of the system, of the criminal justice system, rather than sort of turning it into something that is meant to be Halloween, scary, populist nonsense, quite frankly. We understand that this man has already been charged. Nobody has failed to recognise that he should be charged for the murder of three little girls. I mean, the crime is horrific and he doesn't really need to explain that to the country as a whole. What we have since learnt, he thinks, will fuel people who feel somehow that they can no longer trust the institutions, which is a remarkable thing, really, because... They are being told this information. This information has come out. And yet he's trying to turn it into a question of cover-up. Well, ever since I have been covering UK politics, the Conservative Party has always tried to badge itself as the party of law and order, the party yeah. that stands with the police. And here we have someone who aspires to be the leader of the Conservative Party saying, well, the police are covering up stuff and they're not telling us things. And we had a right to know immediately. Now, the investigation is ongoing. Mm. The police arrest the guy. Presumably they take away his laptop computer or whatever. And maybe it's been some weeks later that they find buried deep on it some file that links him to whatever. I don't know. We don't know. Yeah. But why do we have a right to know immediately? What difference does it make? What? Why are you trying to undermine the institution of the police? Because in this country, policing is done by consent. And that's a big difference from yeah. the US or France, where all the police carry guns. Yeah, it's not military. It, it's not military. It relies on a sense of trust and undermining that. There's been no cover up. The police have laid additional charges. Look, I, I think if you step back... It is perfectly valid to say there are many cases in which public trust in our institutions has been badly hit by scandals like the blood scandal, the post office scandal, the cover up at Hillsborough. It's not that we don't have these examples in our recent past of terrible cover ups when the public has been lied to. But it is really important that our leaders or our potential leaders don't try and create situations whereby 
They pretend there has been cover up when due process is being sought and followed. And at the moment, we've got somebody who thinks they might edge it in this contest by making people scared. It's a very similar tactic to the one that Donald Trump has been using in the US for eight years. He's not alone. He's made it electorally successful. And Jenrick, you can't help thinking, is hoping the same thing will rub off on him here. And he should know better. The old, I think it's a biblical quote that the wheels of justice turn slowly but grind exceedingly fine. It takes a long time but justice will get there in the end if you have trust in the justice system. We've always had trust in the justice system. Let the court process take its course. If everyone is tweeting immediately about who they think is guilty, what they did, what their background is, with insufficient information, you create a climate of fear. You're not yeah. helping people deliver justice. I mean, look, sometimes you do get the wrong result. You know, the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, these are sort of etched into the brains of anyone who has followed, you know, the rule of law and seen where mistakes were made. But I don't think it's helpful for our politicians to be leading that debate when nothing has actually happened. The trial has not <laughs> happened we yet. We haven't had a trial. If We've had a man a who's been charged. If there is a miscarriage of justice that we discover about later, let's put it right. But let us not be saying yeah. that things have gone wrong so, whilst this is still under investigation okay. and a case is about to come to court. So let's be mature about this. We know that he knows that. He's a lawyer. He's a smart man. He wants the leadership of the Conservative Party. So why is he doing this? Because he thinks... This will give him an advantage amongst the membership. Don't forget, this isn't the country voting. It is about 135,000 people, the diehard Conservative membership. And he thinks somehow he is opening up space between him and Kemi Badnock, who famously didn't actually get involved during the summer when the riots were going on, the protests were going on. She held her council precisely, she says now, because she didn't think she was in full possession of all the facts and didn't need to weigh in. So why does he think that this is a good political space to operate? Has he got one eye to the US and what could be happening on Tuesday and is thinking, shoo in there? Well, we're joined now by uh, Gavin Barwell, uh, former Conservative MP, former Chief of Staff to Theresa May, current member of the House of Lords and Tory grandee. Yeah, I think Tory grandee. Uh, Gavin Barwell, thanks so much for being with us. Voting has just ended in the Tory leadership contest. Are you feeling comfortable about the result, whoever wins? Uh, no, not not particularly. I'm not, I'm not necessarily surprised. I think the history of British politics would tell you that when parties lose elections, they often find it hard to learn the appropriate lessons. You think about Labour in 1979 or 2010 or the Conservative Party in 1997. So to my mind, James Cleverley was probably the best choice of, of the four that were on offer post-party conference. And I, you know, I, I have some concerns about the choice that was that was finally put to the members. Um, but it doesn't particularly surprise me that the party has moved in this direction. Have you voted? Uh, I didn't vote. So you're abstaining. You don't. None yeah, of the yeah, above. I, did, I didn't. Uh, I didn't feel sufficiently enthusiastic about either candidate to vote for them. Can we play you a little bit of a promotional video that Robert Jenrick has released this week and just get your thoughts on what he's actually saying here? As the dad of three daughters, the Southport attack hit me personally. Of course, the legal process needs to be respected, but I'm seriously concerned that the facts may have been withheld from the public here. The government and authorities told us for months that they were not treating this as a terrorist incident. But today, the attacker has been charged with terrorist offences, and it has been revealed that he has been allegedly reading terrorist manuals. This atrocity was of immense public concern. The public had the right to know the truth right away. Any suggestion of a cover-up will permanently damage trust in whether we are being told the truth about crime in our country. What is your thoughts on that? I think anyone that served as a minister will know that when you've got an active court case, the best thing to do is for ministers not to comment upon it. And, you know, the, the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, Prime Minister's questions this week gave MPs very similar guidance. So I understand there's a huge amount of emotion around the appalling crime that we saw in Southport. But what we should do is let the police and the CPS get on with their job, bring the individual 
to trial. And then once that process is complete, if people have got questions they want to ask, by all means, ask the questions. But I, the, the Conservative Party that I joined, one of its kind of core principles was a respect for the institutions of the country. And yeah, it, to me, it's a very strange thing to see a leading Conservative politician essentially accusing the police of a cover up. What does it tell you? Well, I think it I think it speaks to a wider change we see in our politics, not just in this country, but in the US and a number of other countries. You know, this uh, which I suppose sort of Nigel Farage is a, is an exemplar of in our own politics. Um, but it's it's an increasing sense of institutions being under attack. Um, and it's not some I, I don't think it's the right course for the Conservative Party to go. Under. As I said, I, I entirely understand there's lots of people in this country who felt very strongly about the terrible incident in Southport. But it, it seems to me the idea that there's been some kind of conspiracy, that the police have done their job, they found this evidence, charges have been brought. It doesn't feel to me like this is a cover up. Let's let them get on with their job. Let's let the process complete itself. And then if there's anything that pe questions people want to ask at that point, that's the right time to do it, surely. Gavin, I want to read you a little excerpt from a piece that was written by Douglas Murray. Now, he's only a, a commentator. He's not a politician, but he's writing in The Spectator and he is now the associate editor. And as we know, The Spectator is now edited by Michael Gove, um, formerly of the Conservative government. I mean, a prominent member of of the government in the last 14 years. And this is what Douglas Murray writes. He's talking about the suspect and he says, ah, a typical Welshman, we might say, except that nobody does think that. People knew that there must be more. Soon it was revealed the attacker was of Rwandan heritage, at which point all the anti-speculation people said, you see nothing to see here. He goes on to talk about the police being strangely unwilling to release any information. And this is when people can surmise something with considerable accuracy. If the attacker had been a far-right extremist of the kind we're told is so common in our country and shout, I'm doing this for Oswald Mosley, we would have heard all about it. So he's going one step further than Jenrick. He's saying that there has been an active cover-up because of the institutions leaning leftwards, which means they are trying to conceal something about an attacker's identity to safeguard the country. So if we were in a world, let's imagine a hypothetical situation where this individual was only accused of murder, you went to trial and these details came out in the trial, then maybe I could understand someone making that point. But if how, how do you square what he is alleging with the fact that the police have investigated, have found the evidence and have brought charges in relation to the Al-Qaeda training man and the, and the rice in essentially? So it's, it's not a cover up. The authorities have found the evidence and they brought charges. I mean, I, one of the things I find very hard to understand about these things, in my experience, when you have a conspiracy, the conspirators have something to gain from the conspiracy. What possibly would benefit from the police covering this up and then revealing it to all of us and then being subjected to all of this criticism? How does that, how does that benefit them? It's, I just find it inexplicable. So, look, you know, We've seen it with Donald Trump in the US, where he espouses conspiracy theories about the FBI and the CIA and is undermining the very institutions of law and order from the Republican Party, which used to badge itself as the party of law and order, just as the Conservative Party has done uh, in the past. Do you worry that the Conservative Party is becoming Trumpified, Trumpian, whatever the correct word is? I definitely worry that there are people who are trying to push it in that direction. I don't think the whole party's in it. I've still got many very close friends who are Conservative MPs or Conservative activists. So I think it would be completely wrong to colour the whole party in that direction. But whether it's whether it's the Conservative Party itself or reform, I think what we can't deny is that there are forces in our politics in this country that are trying to push us in this direction. And if Donald Trump wins next Tuesday, those forces are likely to be boosted. And it's not just here, John, is it? Right? If we look at if we look around Europe, you can see the same things playing out in nearly every major European country. But I I just remember in the States in twenty fifteen when Trump was running for the nomination, people saying he could never take over the Republican Party. The Republican Party is built on solid foundations and you look at it now and it is an entirely Trumpian party. I are you worried that if Robert Jenrick 
wins, that is what he will try to recreate the Conservative Party as. I wouldn't just personalise it about Robert. There are clearly people trying to drag the Conservative Party in that direction. And I think the challenge for people like me is you have to understand why this form of politics has some force. It's no good just saying, I don't like it. So you have to recognise when you, if you see this as a phenomenon, if it was just Trump in the US and we didn't see this here in the UK or anywhere else, you could say, well, maybe it's just a sort of personality cult, right? It's a one-off. But the fact that in nearly every advanced economy in the world, every democracy in Europe and North America, you see some kind of populist right iteration tells you that lots of voters have got concerns that they don't think mainstream politicians have been addressing. Gavin, you worked as Theresa May's chief of staff. Is this something that you discuss with Lady May? I mean, is this a conversation that is active, you know, amongst the very top of, of the Conservative Party as was? It's something we discussed at the time when we were working together. And I think it's I think it's people not just in the Conservative Party, I think across politics. This is a this is what mainstream politicians should be talking about. And if I could maybe just for a second link it back to the budget yesterday. The most concerning chart to me in the budget documents yesterday was one suggesting that uh, real household disposable incomes were going to undergo their second smallest ever increase in this parliament, the previous smallest being the last parliament. And that's one of the drivers of this populism. If people are not feeling that mainstream politics is delivering for them in terms of rising living standards, that's one of the things pushing them to this form of politics, coupled, I would argue, with sort of social media and, and the way in which you can get a huge amount of disinformation pumped into our democracies by hostile states. So it's no good people like me just saying, I don't like it. We have to recognise that it has an appeal. Why does it have an appeal? And how can we address the roots of that appeal? And bring it back here, because at the moment, there is basically a cigarette paper between where Jenrick now stands in his rhetoric and where Farage now stands in his rhetoric. So, I mean, is that pretty much the same party now? So I, I, that's one of the reasons I think he would, it would be a mistake for the Conservative Party to select him. All right, so two very quick points I'd make. One is the polling is very clear that the reform voters, the ones that switch to reform are the hardest to win back. But secondly, and this seems to me so obvious, I don't understand why it's argued about. There's a simple mathematical fact, which is if we say that you had switched from the Conservatives to Labour and John had switched from the Conservatives to reform, your vote counts double his. You've taken one off the Conservative total in my seat and you've added one to the Labour total. The switcher to reform has just taken one off the Conservative total. So the right people to prioritise are the direct switches to Labour or the Liberal Democrats. And Robert is saying the opposite. He's saying, let's go after the reform people who are less, you know, worth less. I'm not being, I'm not judging them as people, but they're... Electorally. One change to the the majority and they're the hardest people to get back. So, you know, I, I want to say something positive about him, right? He's, one of the things you could say about him, I think he's run the most professional campaign and I think he's clearly wants it. He's worked incredibly hard at it. My differences with him are about strategy and about whether that's the right way for the Conservative Party to go, both from a kind of ethical question, but also then whether actually it's going to be effective. Let's assume he wins uh, the Tory leadership and takes it in the direction that he has sort of set out in his uh, campaigning. And, you know, the clip we just played you of him talking about uh, kind of facts being withheld and conspiracy theories and the like. Is there a place for you in a Conservative Party like that? I think I think it would be difficult. I saw George Osborne the other day saying he would find it very difficult to support a Conservative Party that was in favour of withdrawal from the ECHR. And and you're in he, that position. And I think there's quite a few people that will be in that position. Um, so this, is, I think, is the danger of the strategy. What I have to accept, and I'm trying to be as generous as I can today, is that I can't have exactly the Conservative Party I want. In order for the Conservative Party to win, it's got to build a broad coalition of voters. And that means that I have to compromise with uh, you know, people on the right of the party. And I won't get exactly what I want on every issue. But the flip is also true. If you pursue an agenda where you get to a point where an, a large number of people, mainstream conservatives say, we just cannot support that, then that's not going to work electorally for him. We've talked about Trump and Trumpifying the Conservative Party. I mean, very possible next Tuesday, Trump wins the presidential election. Prime yeah. Minister Starmer is having to deal with President Trump. Yes. Prime Minister May had to deal with President Trump. And I heard all sorts of, I mean, hair raising stories about how 
rude he was to Theresa May. And there was the famous incident where he comes over to Britain and gives an interview to the Sun about how great Boris Johnson would be as Prime Minister. Can you deal in any normal way with Donald Trump? It's a completely different kind of relationship to any normal one. Normally, when you when you deal with the head of government of another country, the relationship, at least in large part, is defined by what's the, the two countries' relationship like. If you're allies, you're going to get on okay. Obviously, there's a bit of personal chemistry there as well. But I think Donald, Donald Trump, in my experience, approaches geopolitics more as a real estate deal maker than a politician. What he learned in his business career is you kind of play your cards close to your chest and you make a deal when someone makes you a good offer. And really with him, he's happy to do those deals with countries that are the US's close allies or countries that are not US allies. He, he doesn't view the world in the way that most heads of government do. And you know, I think then politically, it was often very difficult for Theresa because he would say something that nearly everybody in the UK would disagree with. And she'd be at PMQs and the Labour MP would challenge her to disassociate herself from it. And the British Prime Minister needs to get on with the US President. So how do you handle that kind of question? Gavin Bowell, thank you. It is worth saying, we did reach out to Robert Jenrick. Um, we'd love to hear from the horse's mouth what, what he's thinking, what his thoughts are about that whole thing. We haven't heard back from him or the team yet. Obviously, our doors are open. We would love to understand what that video is about. So meanwhile, in this crazy world in which being hauled in front of a court in the US seems to help electoral chances rather than hinder them, Elon Musk is appearing in Pennsylvania, trying to defend his online offer of as much as a million dollars to swing state voters who agree to sign what he set up, a sort of petition pledging their support for free speech and the right to bear arms. That's technically what it's called. Of course, what it looks like in practice is that he's trying to get to the hearts and, I guess, wallets of swing voters by making them register to vote in places where their vote is absolutely critical. And he's now trying to get this whole court appearance moved into a higher, into a federal court, right? So he's, he's going towards the law, not away from it. So let's go back to basics. You cannot pay someone to vote and you cannot pay someone to register to vote. So what Elon Musk is doing is he is saying to people, do you believe in the Second Amendment, i.e. the right to bear arms? That's broadly speaking, a Republican voter to a large extent. Or, yes. And more. And more. And do you believe uh, in free speech? Yes, I do. Uh, OK, if you register to vote, you can enter this lottery. Yeah. And of course, that looks like it's on the margins of what is lawful. So the Pennsylvania authorities are saying, "Uh, uh-uh, you can't do this. Mm. This is illegal. And they're bring, bringing a case against him. Elon Musk is saying, fine, br make bring my it on. day. Bring it on. Yeah. Because one, it's going to get a load of publicity. And that helps Donald Trump. And two, I'm really happy for this to go uh, to a federal court, i.e. one that has jurisdiction over the whole of Not America. Not only that, but we're Thursday now. And the election is on Tuesday. And if there's one thing we know as you so eloquently put it, the wheels of justice do not often turn... Within, Very fast. Yeah, within sort of 72 hours. Most people have voted and actually didn't really matter what the slogan was that Elon Musk put on that. I mean, he could have put, you know, do you love bunny rabbits? Here's a million pounds. Here's a million dollars. And people would have gone, I love bunny rabbits. I'd like to win a million pounds. The point is he's got their names and addresses and he's got them to sign up and register, right? And the other point is that just the kind of slightly wider point. I have never known the billionaire class tried to exercise such muscle in a presidential election campaign. Yeah, and we've known for years that wealthy people have donated. Yeah, you to have. I mean, look like at the this. Koch it's... brothers. Look at look at all the money that went on. Or on the other side, look at Sam Bankman Freed, who weirdly was at one point trying to pay Donald Trump billions not to enter. Now he's now he's now in prison. Yeah. So that didn't work out. But but, the, but the, there's one huge difference, and that is you know you are seeing big breaking news stories. So, for example, we debated it earlier on uh, when John Kelly came out and said that Donald yeah. Trump was a fascist. And the New York Times, it was a New York Times interview. They put it up on X. They would have expected normally in normal circumstances for that to get tens of thousands of retweets and likes. 
It didn't. Look, the prism of social media has massively changed. It's of not just it has. that a billionaire is giving money. A billionaire is giving his algorithm yeah. and changing the way what yeah, people yeah. will see. And one of the reasons there wasn't such a furor over John Kelly's comments about Donald Trump being a fascist was that not that many people saw it. Look, when the- Bill Gates gave millions or the Koch brothers gave millions, it either went into the wheels of the campaign. Yeah, the I.e. advertising, the, all the rest These of are it. the adverts, these are the leaflets, these are the people that are door knocking, all the rest of it. Or else it went through traditional media channels, not just mainstream, but anyone who was disseminating that information. Now, Musk only needs himself to both donate and disseminate. And I think that's what's different about this time. Donate, around. disseminate, create a structure like a lottery where people win a million dollars a day for registering. So, you know, Trump yeah. supporters are getting going to register now, you know, because they think, oh, I might win the lottery. Is that paying for someone to register or not? I tell you that what. That is the great yeah. area in which he's deliberately uh, put himself in the bid to drive up Trump Look, votes. Look, where Trump has consistently been really clever has been on exploiting grey areas, yeah. right? The fact is that the courts of law and the Democrats are behind because they know this doesn't pass the smell test. They know it feels and sounds and looks really dodgy, but they have got to spend time and money and resources and intellect fighting it, whereas he's just doing it. And I think once again, he's going to get ahead of the electoral cycle. I mean, this does not mean, obviously, that he's winning. This does not mean that Pennsylvania is going to fall to Trump. We don't know. The polls are really, you know, really complicated at this point, and, and we're not offering forecasts on that. But it does mean that in terms of exploiting loopholes, you know, call them dirty tricks or call them clever tricks. They're ahead on this. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, Donald Trump is exploiting gaffes, which is the time honoured tradition in politics. And he is kind of was seen yesterday in a dumper truck, in a garbage truck, uh, leaning into what Joe Biden said following Tony Hinchcliffe's comments at the Madison Square Garden gig about Puerto Rico being a floating island of garbage. And then, you know, it's Biden's comments that have now been seized on by Trump. So Trump, having had a bad few days, now seems to have a good few days. Yeah, I remember when the um, deplorables line came out, Hillary Clinton calling uh, Trump voters a basket. Actually, not all Trump voters, but the racists amongst them, a basket of deplorables. And the next thing you knew was this fantastic little despicable me minion recreated saying deplorable me and everyone had the t-shirts and everyone had the bump stickers and that was how it went it's interesting just to go back to where you were I've been talking to Steve Bannon weirdly since he's emerged from prison trying to get a sense of where he thinks the numbers are and where they're kind of campaigning and where they think they're up and where they're down and I asked him I mean he's been very bullish as you can imagine because that's kind of what he does and that's who (laughs) he is and that's who he is and he's been sort of saying oh you know this is going really well and here's going really well and it's all going really you know great when I asked him about Pennsylvania when I asked him about the Puerto Rican vote there there was zero response so my my interpretation of that not to overthink these things is They were very aware for 48 hours that that was damaging. And this is them leaping onto whatever can be construed as a gaffe and turning it into the thing that they need to save the last few days. And if you can basically make out that Kamala Harris, who, you know, as we said yesterday, stood in Washington, you know, right in front of the White House, sort of pinning herself in a way to that administration and that visual, thinks that you're garbage then, you know, cheap hit. Well, Lewis, you might have noticed, has spent the week in Florida and he's been working on a longer film, which is all about abortion, very much central to the Harris campaign and very much central to the way many in Florida will probably be voting or have voted already. And Lewis, where is the story taking you? What have you heard? Well, Emily, we're in um, Lakeland, uh, Florida, which is in in central Florida as part of that sort of tour around the the state. And you know what? It's funny. We were actually going to, the the plan was to basically, when we came, was to to, to make a, a really long piece about the kind of the political forces that have reshaped Florida, rather than, as we were saying earlier in the week, doing a, a, a swing state where it's very difficult to actually know what's going to happen in an election this close. And really sort of focus that on Trump and MAGA and how, in so many ways, he and they have kind of radicalised quite a bit of the population of this state and the sort of political infrastructure around it. But when we were sort of looking into it and, and, and talking to people, 
the same thing kept coming up again and again, which was this issue, which is sort of central to that, but also sep entirely separate to Trump as well, which is abortion. And having spent time talking to people who are affected, having uncovered some stories of our own, which are really shocking, which we're going to bring you tomorrow, we just realised that this was a story we just had to tell and tell it in full and not just do it tangentially, not just do it in parenthesis, give it the full time. Because I think that in so many ways, British audiences will find it shocking what is going on in Florida. In so many ways, and this is a theme that we're going to get into tomorrow, in so many ways, the state government of Florida has turned into something of a theocracy with regards to this issue, which is having dramatic effects on everyday life in this state. And it is shocking stuff. And Lewis, can you see any, I mean, look, there are obviously dramatic human stories about people who suddenly are unable to access, um, you know, abortion care or whatever it happens to be as a result of changes being made. Are you seeing a political read across in terms of whether the state government, which is Republican in Florida, is going to suffer as a result of that? It's really interesting, John. And this, I think this is there are so many imponderables to this election, aren't there? there are so, we don't know whether Trump is going to keep being able to sort of motivate his very particular base, whether that's being underestimated yet again. We don't know whether Kamala Harris is going to be able to motivate a unique coalition of her own, which is being underestimated in the polls. And I think another imponderable, which is linked to that last question, is precisely what role, if any, abortion being on the ballot in states like Florida has in terms of the presidential race. It's on the ballot. I say that because there is a constitutional amendment in Florida, like there is across a lot of big states, basically enshrining uh, abortion rights on the ballot, basically trying to reverse the Republican-led gov state government's um, basic abortion ban, which has been in place for under a year now. It's a six-week limit now. And it's a tough hurdle to cross because they have to get 60% of the vote in order to vote yes and get it con uh, a member and get abortion rights enshrined. Um, but even if they can't quite get to 60%, there is hope among Democrats that, yeah, you know, because of the real, real energy that there, there is behind that campaign, that they can get Democrats out who are maybe lower propensity voters who wouldn't normally turn out to vote, but turn out and vote yes to abortion rights. And then since they're there anyway, give Democrats their vote, which boosts Harris's chances across those states. So, yeah, it is possible. And I guess the other thing about all of this is that for Ron DeSantis, the governor, he is putting so much political capital into getting these tougher abortion laws passed that he becomes something of a lame duck. It kind of it's tied up to his future now. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so right. I mean, I was talking to someone here yesterday, sort of Democrat operative, who was saying that that is if they can get Amendment 4 passed. And again, it's, it's it requires a threshold of 60 percent of the vote. It's currently polling tantalizingly for them at about 59 percent of the vote. If they can get it passed, it will be such a body blow to DeSantis. And as you say, John, has 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 attached such political weight and premium of his own, such political capital on this issue. And I think it goes sort of wider than that as well, which is that, you know, for a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans, they see what's happened in Florida under DeSantis, not just on abortion, but on a whole suite of other culture war kind of issues, whether it's on trans, what is available in schools, Bible, what books are available in schools, book burning, all of this sort of stuff. They see it, as someone said to me yesterday, as ground zero of what a future Republican-led government in the presidency, House and Senate would look like. Someone said to me, you know, you look at Project 2025, we had Project 2025 in Florida in 2024. So they think that this is kind of the front line, if you like, of these emerging, the frontiers of these emerging cultural political battles, which have certainly dominated America to some extent, but which have been dominant in Florida for even longer. And not to dwell too much on book burning, but I do understand that that was <laughs> a, a very, a very central part of the phone in show that you were hosting this morning when you were promoting several books to the good people of Florida, including Strangeland. Well, you know what, Emily? I mean, um, I just couldn't stay off live radio for a whole week. So since we're here anyway, we uh, decided to drop in on our friends with Polk County Radio. And um, yeah, I fulfilled my contractual obligations. Listen to this. Uh, so our guest is uh, Lewis Goodall. He is a uh, British journalist and broadcaster and author. And uh, we didn't even get a chance to talk about your book. 
Uh, but is that all out of date? Is now, it anyway? just the one for now? Just the one for now. Okay. Just the one. Now I, I, I'm not allowed to um, to publish any books while uh, my co-host John Sopel has got his one out. So um, okay, that's, that's a contractual obligation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. yeah. Strange Land. It's called, by the way. If any of you want to, I, I need to get that plug in for him. Strange Land. If any of you want and, to buy, and give it. the title of yours as well. Oh well, I wouldn't. You know what? It is called Left for Dead. But unless, I mean, there may be some listeners out there in Polk County Radio this morning who um, are very interested in. Um, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party out of 2018, but I can't imagine it's that many. So uh, if they are, if they are, it is available. There you go. Is Lewis just part of your marketing team? Is that is that is that all he's doing? Is he just literally sowing your Strangeland seeds far and wide? I haven't Let's said, not talk I, about his strange seeds. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying my seeds outside this studio. Oh, all right? Oh, That's man. even more grim. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> In fact, Lewis will see you tomorrow. We're on a plane. Bye-bye. See you the other side. Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 